Hey everyone, Turd Flinging Monkey, obviously. This video started out as a response to John the Other's video about phrenology and pseudosciences. However, I would instead like to address the larger issue about what is science in general and the differences between hard or natural sciences, soft or social sciences, and pseudosciences. Let's begin by defining our terms in order to eliminate confusion up front. Hard or natural sciences are the easiest to understand and explain. According to the Oxford Dictionary, the natural sciences deal with the physical world. Examples include mathematics, physics, chemistry, geology, and biology. Soft or social sciences are again according to the Oxford Dictionary, the scientific study of human society and social relationships. Examples include economics, politics, sociology, archaeology, anthropology, psychology, and yes, that includes evolutionary psychology. The soft sciences often do make heavy use of the hard sciences. Economics is built on mathematics, while archaeology is built on geology, and anthropology is built on biology. However, not all social sciences are created equal. For example, political science is built on psychology, which is itself a social science, which is built on biology and chemistry. As social sciences are built on other social sciences rather than natural sciences, they become less respected as actual science. A pseudoscience is defined by the Oxford Dictionary as simply a collection of beliefs or practices mistakenly regarded as being based on scientific method. That doesn't really help us much as the definition is rather vague. However, the website yourdictionary.com gives several examples of pseudosciences that I think illustrate the point very well. Here is a list of some pseudosciences from the website. Astrology, Crop Circles, Flat Earth Society, Hollow Earth Theory, Bermuda Triangle, Cryptozoology, Dowsing, Extrasensory perception, also known as ESP, hypnosis, polygraphy, also known as lie detection, feng shui. I think you get the general idea. The website defines a pseudoscience as beliefs, theories, or practices that have been or are considered scientific but have no basis in scientific fact. This could mean that they were disproved scientifically, can't be tested, or lack evidence to support them. So having these official definitions out of the way, I wish to present a simplified way of looking at the differences between the three. These aren't meant to replace the definitions, just offer a way to distinguish between them easily. A hard or natural science can be readily tested and proven objectively. There is no room for interpretation. A soft or social science may be tested, but the results are not objective, thus leaving room for interpretation. For example, there is only one math. There are not multiple theories of math, just math itself. Conversely, in economics, there are different economic schools and theories, despite economics being built on a mathematical foundation. Things like political science, which are built on other social sciences rather than natural sciences, are almost entirely based on interpretation. The differences between a soft science and a pseudoscience is unfalsifiability, meaning that there is no test to prove or disprove it. Unlike a soft science, which can be proven to reflect observable reality or not, in pseudoscience, the lack of success or abundance of failure is not proof of anything. For example, just because nobody has ever seen Bigfoot, and every supposed sighting is a proven hoax, doesn't prove there isn't a Bigfoot, right? That pseudoscience. Now, before looking at evolutionary psychology, we need to talk about evolution. Is evolution a natural or a social science? It actually depends because while we can observe and verify some aspects of evolution, we can't prove other aspects of evolutionary theory. Darwin summarized his theory of evolution by natural selection as a process whereby, quote, more individuals are produced each generation that can survive, phenotypic variation exists within individuals and variation is heritable. Those individuals with heritable traits better suited to the environment will survive. We can observe, test, and verify that natural selection occurs all around us in biology. So far, so good. But when scientists get into the origin of life, chemical evolution, the Big Bang, etc., we cannot recreate and thus observe, test, and verify these phenomena. The best we can do is use what we know now to make educated guesses about the past barring any contradictory evidence. This is how anthropology and archaeology work as well. As we do not have a time machine, we can only make educated guesses regarding ancient and extinct cultures based on what we know. Occasionally, a new discovery is made that contradicts the current paradigm, and the paradigm changes in response. As more discoveries are made, the paradigm becomes closer to the presumed truth as new facts disprove alternative theories. However, we will never know for sure because we cannot go back in time and verify what we think we know about the unobservable past. Now that we've established that evolution itself contains elements open to interpretation, and that psychology is itself a social science open to interpretation, we should be cautious when invoking something like evolutionary psychology as a proven scientific fact, because it's not. However, it is not a pseudoscience as long as it can be shown to accurately reflect reality and has the ability to be falsified. This doesn't mean that evolutionary psychology isn't controversial, 
All social sciences are controversial because they are open to interpretation. What matters is whether or not it is testable and falsifiable. Let's look at the parts of evolutionary psychology which have been tested, verified, and have yielded success, which is the study of behaviors and traits that occur universally in all cultures and within our animal relatives. According to Walter Cohen of the Encyclopedia Britannica, quote, there have been many careful and informative studies of human social behavior from an evolutionary perspective. Infanticide, intelligence, marriage patterns, promiscuity, perceptions of beauty, bride price, altruism, and the allocation of parental care have all been explored by testing predictions derived from the idea that conscious and unconscious behaviors have evolved to maximize inclusive fitness. The findings have been impressive, unquote. This brings us to an intersectionary discipline of science known as behavioral ecology, which is a relatively modern development in the world of ethnology or the study of animal behavior. This area of research feeds very nicely into the behavioral areas of evolutionary psychology and should probably be discussed more within the MGTOW community, but I digress. Let's look at a practical example of the intersectionality of evolutionary psychology and behavioral ecology, that being hypergamy. The definition of hypergamy is simply when a woman marries a person of a superior caste or class than herself. However, the way the word is used within MGTOW, especially by me, often refers to how a woman is attracted to a man's money or utility and doesn't really love him as a person. First, can we verify that this behavior indeed exists in humans? I'll link to an article from The Telegraph referencing a study from the National Academy of Sciences which, amazingly, confirms that men desire beautiful women and women desire rich men. I'm not sure how impressed you are, but here's where evolutionary psychology slash behavioral ecology comes in. Do we see the same behavior in animals? Let me quote a paraphrase of the 2012 textbook An Introduction to Behavioral Ecology from Wikipedia, involving mate choice by resources. Quote, in many sexually reproducing species, such as mammals, birds, and amphibians, the females are responsible for bearing the offspring for a certain period of time, during which the males are free to mate with other available females, and therefore can father many more offspring, thus continue to pass on their genes. The fundamental difference between male and female reproduction mechanisms determines the different strategies each sex employs to maximize their reproductive success. For males, their reproductive success is limited by access to females, while females are limited by their access to resources. In this sense, females can be way choosier than males because they have to bet on the resources provided by the males to ensure reproductive success. Resources usually include nest sites, food, and protection. In some cases, the males provide all of them. The females dwell in the chosen males' territories for access to these resources. The males gain ownership of the territories through male-male competition that often involves physical aggression. Only the largest and strongest males manage to defend the best quality nest sites. Females choose males by inspecting the quality of different territories or by looking at some male traits that can be indicative of the quality of resources. Sometimes males leave after mating. The only resources that a male provides is a nuptial gift, such as protection or food. The female can evaluate the quality of the protection or food provided by the male so as to decide whether to mate or not or how long she's willing to copulate." Unquote. Did any of that ring a bell or sound vaguely familiar to anyone else? Now, if you want to argue that these behaviors are socially conditioned, caused by Jews, social Marxists, or whatever, why are these behaviors found in so many animals as well? When MGTOW talk about female nature, it goes far beyond the government or legal environment. Governments and laws come and go, but women will always trade sex for resources and utility, which is why I say that all women are gold-digging whores and should never be allowed to vote. That will never change unless and until humans somehow transcend their biology using technology and reproduce asexually through cloning or something similar. It is often said that feminism is just female nature personified, and I agree. What is feminism other than women using the government to get men's resources by proxy? Where did women get this desire for men's resources? Was it nature or was it nurture? I would say that the evidence points pretty conclusively to nature, but you're free to disagree. After all, the study of behavior is by definition a social science and thus open to interpretation. You're free to come up with an opposing rationale for this behavior being found throughout humanity and animals as being socially constructed. And I would absolutely love to hear it and see your evidence. If you have no opposing rationale, and your rebuttal is simply that you don't know, I don't know, and nobody can ever know, then that's what's known as solipsism, which is itself an unfalsifiable hypothesis, and would fit the definition of a pseudoscience if it was a science at all. I'm not saying I'm right, I'm just saying that as far as our current knowledge is concerned, I'm as close to the truth as I can possibly be. But if new knowledge is discovered, I will change my views accordingly. That is the essence of science. That is the essence of truth. And truth should be the essence of MGTOW.